Hello, I'm Jeremy Kinney. I'm the Associate Director for Research and Curatorial Affairs at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Welcome to tonight's GE Aviation Lecture. Whether you are here with us in person at the Stephen F. Verhazy Center or tuning in from across the country. The GE Aviation Lecture Series is the museum's longest running sponsored program. We've hosted more than 150 GE lectures since 1982, spotlighting everything from icons of aviation like Sikorsky helicopters and the Navy's top gun school to modern day advancements in aviation like sustainability efforts and the future of supersonic flight. Our GE lectures this fall celebrate the wonderfully varied and important world of general aviation. Tonight's program, The Flying Eye Hospital, Medicine Meets Aviation, explores how aviation is increasing access to eye care in communities around the world through the Orbis Flying Hospital, a plane unlike any you've seen before. Thanks to GE Aerospace, we are able to provide access to these programs free of charge, both in person and online, reaching more people than ever before. Representing GE Aerospace in the audience tonight is their Community Relations and Education Programs Manager, Deb Silverman. Thank you, Deb, and GE Aerospace for your ongoing support. With help from our partners like GE Aerospace, we are ready to inspire new generations of visitors for decades to come. This is an exciting time to be at the National Air and Space Museum. We've just opened eight new galleries this fall, the first phase of our ongoing project to reimagine over 20 galleries and presentation spaces at the museum in DC. The reimagined National Air and Space Museum will tell the transformative stories of flight in new ways to new audiences. I hope you will come by to see our first open gallery soon. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Aeronautics Curator Dorothy Cochran to introduce tonight's speakers. Dorothy. Thank you, Jeremy, and good evening, everyone. Uh, throughout the history of aviation, there's always been a humanitarian calling, the desire to help people in need. Aviation offers game-changing abilities of time and access to reach out to human, environmental, or disaster situations. These are noted in all eight new galleries at the National Air and Space Museum mall building that Jeremy just spoke of but they are expressly addressed in the Thomas W. Haas We All Fly Gallery that defines general aviation, all non-commercial, non-military flight. There, in the humanitarian unit, we include the unique mission of the Orbis International Flying Eye Hospital, established in 1973 with the goal of fighting avoidable blindness by bringing eye care and medical training to communities in need. And what a remarkable humanitarian organization it is. This year, Orbis is celebrating the 40th anniversary of its first humanitarian flight. Let's view the introductory video to set the stage for our program this evening, Medicine Meets Aviation. Meet Rose, a four-year-old girl from a nomadic family in Mongolia. Not too long ago, her eyes were swollen and in pain, and her blurry vision was getting worse. She couldn't play like she wanted to, and her family was worried. Too many people around the world live like this every day because of blindness or vision loss that's completely avoidable. Access to better eye care could eliminate most of these cases and be life-changing for individuals, their families, and their communities. Orbis fights avoidable blindness by training eye care teams to treat people in their own communities. Rose visited one of the many hospitals Orbis partners with in Mongolia and around the world through our country programs. It was there that Rose and her family met Dr. Batsitseg. <laughs> Dr. Batsitseg has trained with Orbis for many years. Her journey started during one of our Flying Eye Hospital visits to Mongolia. 
The Plane, a state-of-the-art teaching hospital, allows us to travel the world, developing the skills of eye care teams in areas with the greatest need. Dr. Botsitseg and her team discussed a treatment plan for Rose, but needed more expert advice. They reached out to an Orbis volunteer faculty member for guidance. Dr. Ron Pelton is one of the hundreds of volunteer faculty partnering with Orbis, world-leading experts in eye health who generously share their time to train eye care teams. Dr. Botsitseg spoke with Dr. Pelton via CyberSight, Orbis's telemedicine platform, where eye care teams can grow their skills and access expert advice. With his advice, Dr. Botsitseg performed a successful surgery on Rose. For over 40 years, Orbis has trained hundreds of thousands of professionals like Dr. Batsitseg, who have gone on to treat patients like Rose in their own communities. Restoring sight has positive effects that ripple on and on, like helping someone return to school or work, or to engage in their community again, all of which leads to a more prosperous life. When you support Orbis, you're helping us ensure that where someone lives never determines whether they can see the world around them. Help us today to change the way the world sees. So let's welcome our speakers for this evening. Dr. Hunter Cherwick is Vice President of Clinton, excuse me, Clinical Services and Technologies, Orbis International. Dr. Cherwick received his undergraduate degree in biology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and his medical degree from Duke University. He completed his residency in ophthalmology at Emory University, and then immediately joined Orbis International, where he lectured and worked in over 20 countries aboard the Flying Eye Hospital and helped build the organization's award-winning telemedicine platform, CyberSight. He then worked in Beijing, China with an eye care company, Alcon, as its medical director for surgical training and access to cataract care before returning to Orbis International to continue to support its clinical training efforts and patient care programs. Bruce Johnson is Director of Aircraft Operations, Orbis International. He began to fly with his father at age 14 and soloed on his 16th birthday. After high school, he joined the Air Force, serving for 27 years as an aircraft mechanic and then as a flight engineer, followed by a stint in the reserves. He became a flight instructor first at Boeing and then at FedEx. In 2001, FedEx took over the training and flying of the Orbis Flying Eye Hospital, and Bruce fell in love. In 2008, three years after first volunteering with the program, Bruce was promoted to his current position. He ensures that this unique plane is always fit to fly, and most importantly, is a beloved member of the Orbis family. So we'll transition now to our panel. Hunter and Bruce, would you join me, please? <clears throat> so we have a few questions here that we've come together to, to learn more about the Orbis Flying Eye Hospital. Let's start at the beginning with the origins of Orbis, merging aviation and medicine that began operations 40 years ago. Hunter, who are the players, and what was their vision? Yeah, it's a funny you know, play on words, their vision. We really are lucky. We've been standing on the shoulders of giants now for 40 years, both in aviation and medicine. So people like Al Yulchi, David Payton, Betsy uh, Triptovecki, Tom Knight, these are huge players uh, in their respective fields of simulation, aviation, and medicine. They came together with this wild concept of creating a hospital that would go around the world and show the latest technologies, transferring those skills and building capacity with the eye health providers in those countries. And it's just exciting. I mean, you sit there and you hear the stories, and I'm friends with a lot of the 
the crew members from the 80s and what they were able to achieve without the internet and you know all of these things that we take for granted today, it's incredible. So the fact that the, the, the plane is still flying and doing its mission is just so impressive to me. When you hear about the things that we've had to overcome with 9-11, the COVID crisis, things like that, it's pretty exciting. Mm, very much so. Bruce, how did the resources come together? When did it become apparent that this could be a global game changer for people with vision issues and limited access to care? I think as, as Hunter mentioned, uh, uh, the marriage of aviation and medical started right away with Dr. Payton, uh, uh, Mr. Tripp, the Pan Am, um, uh, Dr. Payton there, and the merger of the two professions, aviation and medical, uh, started out. I've read, of course, I wasn't there when the DCH started, but I've read a lot of the articles where uh, the profession of aviation and medical, you can understand uh, uh, the challenges between the two, the, let alone marrying them together. Uh, I, I read one of the articles that said uh, it's not feasible to put a hospital in a plane. So I think the first start was there with the root of those individuals starting the program, getting an aircraft. We got one donated from uh, United Airlines, uh, figuring out all those uh, technical things. Like for, for instance, there's specific reasons why the OR is where it is. Uh, the floor of an airplane is not uh, conducive to a microscope. Mm -hmm. So all those technical challenges had to be overcome. Uh, but I think uh, Dr. Payton's uh, view of an airplane being used internationally was w was key to that. And then certainly the airplane had the capability to bring that technology to those areas of need. Mm -hmm. Well, the Flying Eye Hospital is a complete airborne teaching hospital that flies all around the world. Walk us through what a visit from the Flying Eye Hospital might involve. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a huge marriage of dissimilar fields, but they actually have a lot in common. Safety, protocols, checklists, things like that. And so we do the same thing with planning. About a year in advance, we're invited by the Minister of Health, and we start meeting with the partner hospital as well as the partner eye health professionals, and we start planning. What do we want to do as far as surgical demonstrations, patients of need, things like that, the lectures, the simulation labs that we build, and it starts a year-long process. About six months uh, before the plane lands, we start getting all the permissions, the hotels, the security, the ground transportation. But what really is exciting in the last you know, 20 years is two weeks before that plane lands, every single patient is discussed on CyberSite, our telemedicine platform, mm -hmm. so that when we land, we already know all of these patients the partners and the volunteer faculty, which I'll talk about later, these wonderful professors have already been communicating. So we have all the right supplies. And when we start our clinic day, everyone's already knowing each other. And it's almost like they've gotten together and be discussing patients for years. And they've only known each other for a few hours because they've been discussing this online. So it really is uh, kind of a, the plane is an engineering masterpiece, as Bruce said, to get it accredited as a US hospital and get it through the FAA is a heck of a lot of engineering and thank goodness he deals with that, I don't have to deal with that. And every single one of these programs is really a coordination of multiple players, volunteers, host, partners. I mean, it's just incredible. Each one of these is a miracle in and of itself, just like every patient. Well, and you bring that up, there are three critical elements to or the Orbis story the aviation, the clinical, and the volunteers. As far as aviation, Bruce, this started with a DC-8. How has the plane, or the planes, how have they evolved over the years? Well, uh, typically, as you said, we started with the DC-8, and most of you know that was a, a narrow body airplane. Uh, the space for which you were trying to work in was much smaller than the current aircraft. Uh, and most of the reasons for the, the evolution to, the, to now what we call the third generation was driven by the hospital changes. Uh, even the latest airplane, we went from the, the DC-8, which was a narrow body. There was uh, basically all the rooms were interconnected. There was no real 
uh, separation between maybe the, the soiled room and the, the, the clean room, right? Uh, even the DC-10, as late as it was, that was an upgrade to the DC-8. to the DC It was a wide body airplane. We got a hallway. We kept people from walking through the clinical areas, but still not to what the current airplane is. So we've even divided that more. So it, it was the hospital uh, accreditation type of things and standard of care that changed and required the, the, the new airplanes. Um, it, it is amazing when you go through it, as like I've mentioned before, is the OR is over the landing gear, which is the most stable part of the airplane. Also in wind, uh, the airplane may, uh, many of the pilots will know that an airplane weather vanes into the wind, right? Uh, so that the nose and the tail of the airplane will move, but where the OR does, it rotates, but it doesn't <laughs> physically move. Uh, the floors have been hardened, so when you walk, you don't get the vibration in the microscope where the surgeon would lose sight of the eye. So all that technological things, we have to make our own oxygen, purify our own water, uh, carry all of our own equipment aboard. Uh, so all of that is evolved, even our ground equipment, our, our generators, our med gas units, all of that has evolved as well, as long with the, the three different generations of airplanes. Wow, that's fascinating. The clinical hunter, how did, the or how did Orbis construct the on-site training and medical treatment for in-country programs? And how has that technology been a factor in your success? Yeah, and I think Orvis has always been at the confluence of technology and training. And as Bruce said, it's an incredible platform that he gives us where we now can transform that classroom with 46 seats to a broadcast studio through CyberSight. We'll be taking questions real time from around the world, and there'll be more countries watching the surgery than we have now chairs in the seat. I'm sure when Al Yulchi and David Payton and all these people got together and thought about this, they never thought they'd be connecting the world like that. Mm. We also can convert the plane into a, sim a simulation center. And one of the things I always want people to know is we don't just train the doctors. They're very good at taking the credit and coming in at the last minute. It's the nurses, the anesthesiologists, the biomedical engineers. We can do all of that simulation training. So they'll see one in the classroom, sim one in the laser room or in the, the mid uh, part of the plane, and then actually do the surgery. And that surgery is connected to the classroom real time. So there's unbelievable technology in that plane where we can literally do any surgery that you could do here in Washington, D.C. The only one, we, do, we don't do cosmetic surgery and we don't do LASIK or the refractive surgery. Any other procedure we can do. And if you think about that, that's incredible. No matter where you are in the world, Bruce has built this plane. The only thing we ask of our partners, we need stairs, doctors and nurses that want to work with us, and patients who need our help. That's it. It's a completely self-sufficient hospital. And you think about the, you know, going to Mongolia, a very extreme country with high thermal variances, or going to countries with the desert. All of that we've endured for 40 years. And for me, if you think about it, you said we're celebrating our anniversary. It was 66 years before the Wright brothers took off and someone stepped on the moon. We still have about 26 more years. I can't wait to see what we do with this plane because <laughs> it's just the technology, like we were discussing over dinner, out of all the fields of, of medicine, ophthalmology is the first to have FDA approval for AI and gene therapy, and Orbis is doing both. We're doing gene therapy in the most remote parts of Africa for free and randomized clinical trials that they're not even doing here in the United States. Really? That's what makes, and that's where these founders had this vision. They were so bold. They're, they were 66 years ahead of where everyone else was. And I will say, and, and Bruce is, a, you know, he's being very modest. He's also an incredible trainer. Medicine is 30 years behind aviation training with simulation, team training, checklist. We're catching up, but I can tell you, I sit through his flight attendant training every year and I learn something new every, even if, if it's how to teach what he's teaching. That's what's exciting, is how medicine is pushing, uh, or aviation is pushing medicine. And I never thought, we didn't cover this in med school, and it's going, going on that plane every day is like med school for me. I'm learning something. So that's pretty cool. So to answer your question, I, I think technology is always gonna be driving that plane and the people behind it and also the innovation and it, the plane to me, I know when everyone watches the news these days, you can get really depressed, right? Well, when I look through that window and see people from 12 different countries working together and the only time, you know, they're focused is that patient and teaching each other. It's the best example of functional diplomacy I've ever seen. It's like the flying United Nations. We have all six continents represented and they're all working for one single mission. It's super clear. Well, that leads into my next question, which is, of course, is the volunteers. Um, you know, and this, either of you can, both of you can answer that. Who are they? 
and I guess I assume from what you're saying that they are the bedrock of the entire Orbis story. Yes, and again, we, we, we can't do our mission without volunteers, whether it's volunteer pilots or volunteer surgeons, nurses, anesthesiologists, and biomedical engineers. And for me, it's just been a privilege because we'll sit down, I see the best people in their fields, the best educators, the best surgeons, and we'll sit down and have dinner. And I learned more from that dinner than I did from a month of residency. And I, I took my board exams literally without studying because I had been with every single professor in pediatrics, oculoplastics, glaucoma, retina, cornea. I mean, it's just a, such an incredible school where even where I got you know, great training here in the US, I'll sit down and we see diseases and cases I never saw in my residency. So for me, the volunteers drive our mission. We want people who are obviously amazing global citizens, great clinicians, but the most important thing is teaching. We're there to show how, not show off. And one of my favorite stories, I'm very good friends with a cataract surgeon who has the world record for the most cataracts in one day. He's done over 200 cataracts in one day. When he came to work with us in Ethiopia, he did six because teaching takes time. And I could go, I don't play golf. I could go play golf with Tiger Woods and I'm sure he'd crush me, but I wouldn't learn anything. But this doctor would stand there for an hour and I'm sure it must've driven him crazy because he loved it. He was smiling, got out a piece of paper, drew out diagrams, gave a lecture, did something, came back. That's what we're about is building that connection. And they did it first by flight. Now we're doing it with the internet and simulation. It's just super exciting. And I'm learning every day. Like I, it scares me how much I need to know to go to my, my work every day. And much like the clinical, uh, clinician area, we've got the volunteers on the aviation side as well. Our uh, volunteer pilots, we've, we've had volunteers ever since 82 when our first mission and we do today. Uh, our, our volunteers are all from currently from Federal Express, um, where they donate their time. They've been through uh, throughout the years, been different different uh, airlines. Uh, we have uh, volunteer mechanics uh, in that uh, on the aviation side as well that that, that support the organization. So again, as Hunter mentioned, uh, we couldn't do it without our our volunteers. That's just amazing. Clearly, the Flying Eye Hospital's impact is driven by this marriage of aviation and medicine, but certainly there must be pitfalls in trying to merge the two. What makes this collaboration difficult, challenging? I can speak for my part a little bit, you know, and I, I alluded to that a little bit earlier, when you have the two professions with their strict uh, uh, guidance, whether it be the FAA on our part or uh, the medical portion is, everybody has their rules. And when we first started to make the airplane, uh, you had uh, the clinical side that said, uh, you couldn't use PVC piping, you had to use copper, but aircraft used stainless steel. So we had to go through, okay, which one uh, can, uh, will stainless steel suffice for copper? You, and you wouldn't think about that, right? Unless you're trying to put a hospital inside of an airplane, right? So things like that were, were somewhat difficult to do. Uh, we had an oxygen concentrator in the airplane. Well, hospitals just vent the oxygen over pressure out of the hospital into the atmosphere. We couldn't vent that into an open airplane in the event you had a fire, right? Mm -hmm. So. All those type of challenges were, first of all, you had to know there were a challenge, right? Uh, and then to try to overcome them and get the two professions to agree that one sufficed for the other, you know, uh, was, was, was certainly a challenge. And we had to work through a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Bruce, do you have any? Yeah, I would say the challenge is the challenge, right? Mm. Like every day there's a child who's born who has lost sight or there's someone who's sitting in a village somewhere who's lost their sight. And you know the plane is one of our tools. It's only 20% of our portfolio. We have our telemedicine, we have permanent country offices. I think the challenge is the challenge. What's exciting is we push each other. You know, I push his buttons, I guarantee you. Uh, we've been working together for over 15 years. I know he takes his coffee in the morning. Uh, but you know, I, I will say this, that like, for me, it is that friction of trying to marriage two different fields that actually drives us to figure out more innovative ways to reach the bottom billion, who's sitting there with that vicious cycle of blindness causing poverty, poverty causing blindness, and they can't, and that can all be broken with a five minute surgery, which we can do on the plane. So like for me, that's exciting. And the plane is not gonna solve all the world's blindness, but just like today's you know, event, and thank you again for hosting us, it's bringing attention to the cause. 
I don't think most people realize that you know, most of the world's blindness could be prevented or cured. 90% of that is in low to middle income countries and it disproportionately affects women. Those are things where you, know, you just popped your eyes. You didn't know yeah, that, right? I didn't know that. So the plane is an incredible icon for the organization. It's our heartbeat of the organization. It's also an incredible messaging and advocacy platform. And that's one of the things why I'm so appreciative of your time today and to your audience. That's what's exciting, is letting you all know we're fighting this challenge every day, and you can be part of it. And we need people, you know, we have, I, I was mentoring a 15-year-old, he's now a freshman at Stanford, he was a kid at the time. He invented an app in his home that we've now integrated and used all across India for school screening. Like, it's, it's so exciting, you're sitting there talking, to, and this kid's way smarter than I'll ever be. And he's 15, right? I just met him for the first time in three dimensions after God knows how many Zoom calls, right? Mm. That's what's so exciting. Just like our founders, they had this crazy idea. This 15-year-old solved a problem I couldn't solve. And that's what's exciting. We get ideas from aviation on how to use simulation. Like I said, aviation is so far ahead of us in medicine, it's, it's pathetic. But that's what's exciting are the challenges and figuring out how that use that friction between two dissimilar fields to find the solution that no one else is thinking about. Hmm. Okay. Um, Hunter, something that you mentioned when we spoke previously is how you've gained an appreciation, and you've talked about this to a degree already, uh, that the fields of aviation and medicine can learn from one another. So uh, if you, know, you want to elaborate on that, some other examples? Yeah, so uh, I was very lucky. Uh, I got to fly in the cockpit in the jump seat, one of my first uh, uh, programs with Orbis. And there were several things. I, I don't have an aviation background. I know how to put my chair upright and in the locked position, and that's about it. <laughs> and um, it was amazing, the sterile cockpit, where no one talked below 10,000 feet unless it was absolutely necessary. You know, that's something that we do in medicine now, where we don't joke around, we're not listening to the radio, especially when you're starting or at the critical part of the procedure, everyone's focused, like intensely focused. That's one thing when I learned from aviation, if you ask me one word I learned from that cockpit was focus. The other was the checklist challenge response system, where wings, check, wheels, check. Well, now we do that on every single, we actually teach that at Orbis. Mrs. Jones, check, right eye, check, cataract surgery, check, 26 diopter lens, check. These are technical terms. But that was never done in medicine. Doctors were gods, no one could question them, and it created all kinds of problems. The thing I like about the, the crew mentality and team training is that anyone can stop that takeoff and say, I have a concern. And now that's slowly getting its way into medicine. I also think the sim training, and when I was going through residency, I would do a cataract surgery and they say, you did good, or you did well. Well, I don't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the simulators, they're like, you got a 92 and here's your gaps and here's what you need to work on before your next thing. We're doing that now with more quantitative metrics for training. So like I said, I, I've learned a ton from aviation. I, I think both cultures have performance and safety at the, the key core, but how we get there, we're catching up to these guys. First of all, we, we learned it, we just learned it earlier that uh, we're just bringing it in. I mean, if those of you that have been in aviation any length of time, we had our fair share of issues early on as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that we brought it in a little bit earlier uh, and they're, they're, they're uh, joining the, the crowd. Okay. Well, that's, that's fascinating though. That people, I'm sure, haven't thought about that. And that's, that's great to elaborate on that. Um, tell us about CyberSight, um, its ability to reach so many more people and provide critical training for medical personnel, especially during the COVID pandemic. Yeah, so CyberSight um, is almost at its 20-year mark at Orbis. It was started by a pediatric ophthalmologist, Gene Hevelston, who was a mentor of mine. And when he got back from a program, this is just when digital photography was getting started, uh, he was taking uh, external photos of the children who had misaligned eyes after the surgery and giving continued support to the doctors he had trained. And it's all evolved since then. We've now done over 30,000 consults around the world. And these are not a grandmother asking about their child's glasses. These are super complex cases. For example, there's a pediatric ocular cancer called retinoblastoma. And in the video, you saw the doctors in Mongolia. They're one of our best telemedicine partners. Well, they link with St. Jude's and they're discussing pediatric oncology real time. And these are cases that are being opened and followed for years. We now have democratized AI, where artificial intelligence is being provided to doctors where in seven seconds, 
the back of the eye, the retina, can be examined by our algorithms and be told if the patient has diabetes, macular degeneration, or glaucoma. But to me, CyberSight is just an extension of what the plane was envisioned to be, as a connector. And you're connecting the best trainers, the best clinicians to give that patient in greatest need the best care. And so for me, it's really exciting to see how Orbis has always le leveraged technology like the internet to connect people. And so CyberSight is connecting nurses, doctors, without the plane at any time. I like telling the story, uh, one of my colleagues, his name's Dan Neely, he's a brilliant uh, pediatric ophthalmologist. I give him a hard time, but he's really good at his job. He's been to Mongolia and was working with the doctors who you saw in the video. He came back, and in Indiana, real time, he's supporting them in the operating room in his pajamas while they're sitting there doing the case, and he's now virtually shoulder to shoulder with the doctors that he was with two weeks ago. I mean, this is so James Bond sci-fi. I never thought we'd be doing this. And now it's like, oh yeah, we just did AI in Vietnam. We just did another, we just finished the clinical trial. And I'm like, we just did a clinical trial in Rwanda in AI. I didn't think we'd be doing, I'm sure the founders of Orbis never thought that they would be using artificial intelligence, you know, to, to reach diabetics in, you know, parts of Eastern Africa. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, so CyberSight, I think, is just an extension of the culture at Orbis, where you bring in technology, you bring in the right people, and you're offering novel solutions to a very complex challenge, which we talked about. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is growing. Like, to me, you know, the, the number of people around the world who are gonna be suffering from vision loss could triple by the year 2050. Well, the plane's not scalable, right? We can't do 20 planes. Uh, Bruce, 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 first of all, Bruce's wife would kill him, and then uh, the, the, th the 19 other planes would kill him. But I would say that, you know, we can manage CyberSight where we now have 75,000 users around the world. We're in every country in the world except for two. We have more countries involved in CyberSight than the United Nations or FIFA. You know, and I mean, it's just exciting, right? It's amazing. Yeah, so I think that's, that's what, why, people, why do people like looking at planes go in the sky? Because they're doing the impossible, they're defying gravity. I think this, you know, AI is like totally blowing my mind. I get on, and that's like that 15 year old kid, well, now he's 18, but this 15 year old just solved a problem no one else could solve, and he was in small town Texas, and just, hey, can I help you guys? And now you better believe he's coming back and volunteering with us this summer as an intern, because he's got more to give. So yeah, CyberSight, I think, is just an incredible platform, just like the plane. And it every day, you can go to it right now, you can download the app on the um, Apple or Android. I mean, it's freely available. You're giving away education, and that's what we've always tried to do, is globalize and democratize education and care. Bruce, I meant to ask you, was there um, something in medicine that, that has transferred to aviation? Well, I think, uh, you know, as we talked, the way we train now versus what they're doing now, uh, uh, it was certainly eye-opening to me. And if uh, any of you ever watched the uh, Discovery uh, Wings where we were on, uh, the airplane landed in Calcutta. We happened to have a compressor stall um, on the airplane. And we actually had to go internal to the engine and do a borescope for those of you that, uh, that are around aircraft and know what we're looking at. So we needed an endoscope, right? It just so happened one of our ophthalmologists was aboard the airplane and, and we, we pulled the endoscope out to take a look inside the engine and he was so surprised that it was the same model number is that they used in their, their hospital for patients. Uh, now the probes were different, uh, okay, but the actual model number was the same. Uh, another one that I found that I thought was interesting as well is we use ultrasound for looking for um, uh, stress corrosion in, in, in metal that you can't see. Uh, we use a probe, we use jelly, uh, just like you do uh, in medicine, you know? So the, uh, the technology things, I, I think you, you would be surprised how much of it crosses over. Mm -hmm. And it's the same technology, sometimes the same equipment. Yeah. And we're just using it on an airplane, we're using it on a human. Uh, it, that's, to me, was eye-opening to, to see that. So we have some questions um, from YouTube, from our audience out there. Um, one is, can you tell us a story about a time when you had an outcome that was surprising or one that you never would have expected? A patient outcome? Yeah. <laughs> that happens every time. Um, I, I can tell you um, one of my favorites, uh, there was a gentleman, he was in his 70s, and he was bilaterally blind and his wife had been taking care of him for, for years. 
and we were about to take off the patch, and he goes, uh, Dr. Hunter, can you ask my family to leave? And I said, oh, that's never good, by the way. You know, and so I was like, okay. And uh, he says, is everyone gone? I said, yes. He goes, is my wife still beautiful? And I said, sir, she's been taking care of you for seven years. She's amazing. And he took off the patch, and he hugged her, and he had forgotten it. And it was just so emotional. It was so funny. And I'm sitting there and like seeing little munchkins where they've never really been able to play with their siblings or a grandparent who's never seen their grandchild. But like when you sit there and you realize like this man had been helpless and he just wanted to know like would he recognize her. That's like I, I sit there and I'm like, you know, we live, if you're in this audience and you're watching, you're, you're, you've lived a very blessed life. You don't realize what these hardships and you hear the, the struggles that a lot of these people have faced where they've been marginalized. They're they've, in a vulnerable population. We work, for example, in the Rohingya uh, refugee camp. I got to walk through there right before the pandemic. Put your bad day in perspective. You know, when the barista messes up your double frappuccino, wa pa ba pa da pa da yeah, you, that's, that's, that's a bad day, isn't it? You know, you have to have a macchiato with soy instead of oat. But then you sit there and you hear what these children have been through. And, you know, I wear glasses, I'm wearing contacts right now, but... I can't imagine having to flee my home in the middle of the night as a child and running just not, not even know where to go. And now I'm in a camp and I have no, I have no idea where that's going to end. So the answer is yes. Every, there's stories and, you know, what I love about Orbis is every month I see something amazing. Kid getting their sight back, sunrise on the Taj Mahal. You meet five amazing people pilots, professors, patients, and I have one embarrassing moment, which is usually caught on film. And someone gets it on YouTube, and it just becomes a, a joke for this team. But yeah, I would say when you see a family reconnect, and you go back five years later, and that little munchkin comes up, and the mom just wanted to thank you, and the kid's doing well in school, that's pretty amazing. Like, that's why we do this. Mm, I yeah, see. I think in general, if you just, uh, there's one picture that just comes to mind for me where there's a picture in our archives where you'll see this one young child is staring out the window of the airplane. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty inspiring, like I said. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Oh, yeah. that one. Yeah. And that teddy bear is, uh, we call him Seymour. And so it's Seymour the bear, and every kid gets one. And before they go into surgery, the child is that our nursing team's amazing, and they repurposed a teddy bear, which was supposed to be a comfort tool, to an educational tool. So the kid actually puts the patch on the same eye that they're going to have surgery on Seymour. And then the next day, they first take the patch off Seymour, and it gives them a sense of control, right? You can imagine being a munchkin, coming on this UFO, being surrounded by funny-looking people like me, wearing a mask, speaking a language you don't understand. I mean, we have patients who you know, literally have never been in a plane before or used flushing toilets before, and you're sitting there going, okay, let's just try to put ourselves in these shoes. And that teddy bear brings a lot of kid comfort and joy. It's, it's, it's awesome. That's amazing. Um, you all, let's see. Um, what have you got here? They're zipping questions by me. Bruce, could you speak more to the current plane? Tell us more about it. Um, I know it's changed somewhat from the DC-10. And... Okay. Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, the current airplane is an MD-10-30. Uh, uh, most of you, it started life as a, a DC-10-30, but then went through a major modification where they actually uh, changed the designation uh, to, an, to an MD-10, which basically took it from a, a three-person airplane uh, to a two-person airplane. And it's all glass, all rewired, carbon fiber brakes, state-of-the-art, uh, relatively avionics, can fly anywhere in the world in today's environment. Uh, but then, of course, was modified to house, uh, to house a, a hospital, right. which, again, as we talked about, had some of those challenges, and we needed to, to work with engineering to, to figure out how to install uh, a hospital in an airplane. Uh, unlike the previous two, the DC-8 and DC-10, both of those airplanes, again, for the aviation people, the DC-8 and DC-10 um, went through what they called a supplemental type certificate. It changed the design of the aircraft from the original manufacturer's uh, data and, and the way it was built. 
this airplane has not changed. We didn't do an SDC on this airplane. The hospitals actually freight on this airplane. If you were to go in it, you'll find that it, there's actually a cargo loading system. The hospital is freight. Therefore, the hospital doesn't have to be certified as an airplane. Unlike the DC-8 and the DC-10, uh -huh. they had to go through aircraft certification. The, this current airplane does not. So when I put uh, a carpet or tile or something in the hospital, it doesn't need to meet aviation standards. Although it's actually the same material, I don't have to pay for the certs, though, because it's <laughs> technically not an aircraft. Yeah. But I buy it from the same company that I buy the classroom stuff from. So uh, that allows us to maintain it and update it at a, a much less expense and, and cost to, uh, to do those kind of mods. So there is a considerable difference the way they were thought about. Yeah. Not only that, I think the biggest concern was we always worried about if we lost uh, an airplane for a structural reason, maybe a crack spar or corrosion, we lost both an airplane and a hospital. And the DC-8 and DC-10, because it was a single SDC by serial number only, you could not take the hospital out of that airplane right. and put it in another. This one, it's not part of the plane. So we could actually put it in another airplane and not have to go through the certification with the FAA and everything. So it's, it's, it's an interesting design concept. Yeah, yeah. We can take some questions from the audience. If anyone does, can I, I can't see that we do have a uh, microphone set up. Are there any? One's Somebody's. waving over there, okay. Yes. So the question just for the audience is why we don't do LASIK. Um, it's a great question. Uh, one is the machines are very big and it requires a lot of pre-measurements beforehand. Um, also we address refractive error or needing glasses with glasses, but it's a, it's a wonderful procedure. It's just not one we perform on the plane. The lasers are big, they're complicated, it requires a lot of maintenance, and we're really focused on other diseases. About 30% of our cases are kids. And then because of the growing rate of diabetic, I'm sorry, it's, I can't see you very well, but uh, yeah, uh, things like diabetes, we focus a lot on the back of the eye, retinopathy, but you know, certainly it's, a, it's one of the most commonly performed uh, procedures here in the US for eye care. We just don't do it because of the size and the, the structural requirements of the lasers, et cetera. We do have lasers on the plane for other things like the diabetes and glaucoma, but uh, no, we don't do refractive surgery. Um, you all travel to so many different regions and countries. How has the language and the cultural difference helped both of you, both of your practices grow? Yeah, so I would say, again, I continue to be humbled. I don't even speak English well, right? I mean, you can hear how I speak. Um, I would say that our team's amazing, and we have people from, like I said, over a dozen countries. We usually have a team member who speaks one of the local languages, for example, Spanish, Chinese, um, things like this. But for me, um, I've learned a lot of learning agility. I used to be very structured and I'm still, I try to be disciplined, but if you ask me how Orbis has impacted me as a person, I practice gratitude a heck of a lot more. I've learned to be a lot more flexible and understanding, realize that I've been given a lot of blessings in my life with great parents and, and things like that and I got a lot to give back. And like I said, it calibrates your bad day. Mm. If you ask me what I've learned is, I used to get really upset about stupid things. You know. Let give it a pass. Yeah, yeah I, I, I will say, yeah. I, I, I think Orbis is the best classroom on earth for me, mm. both medically, personally, and culturally. I, I'm not, you know, I think the best way to learn history, geography, language, culture is to travel. And when you see it through the eyes of someone who is often neglected in society, and you see a lot. Um, so for me, if the question's, you know, what has Orbis taught me or what have I gained, it's immeasurable. And I think sort of the same thing for me as well. Um, I got to travel the world. I was, a, I was in the aviation in the military and I saw it at a, in a, I think all of us, whether you uh, go on a vacation to a country and you spend time there, or in my case, doing the, the military, I saw it in one avenue, and seeing it Orbis in the, it's in a different light. Uh, it, and it certainly has an impact. 
but it's, it's different lights. You know, you can't ever go somewhere as a vacation or even in military. It's it, it completely separate, you know. And now you see it in, in the environment. We see it, you know. We, we see the need there, and it really opens your eyes. And I would say it's, it's, it's going back, you know, it's all about connections. And it's really cool to see the resident that you taught 15 years ago now being the chair of a department. <laughs> yeah. Or, like, now they're teaching you things. And for me, that academic legacy, but also like realizing you have friends and people that you really consider colleagues around the world. Like people call me all the time. I got a phone call two days ago. Hunter, I need a neuro-ophthalmologist in Shanghai. Okay. You know, like that's really cool. And these are people I've known and trust. I'm sending loved ones or friends of, you know, uh, loved ones of friends to these people. That's what's cool is the, the, the community we've created either through CyberSight, the plane, things like that. We talked about communications as well as our, our staff itself. What are we, 15 different languages maybe? Yeah. At any one time it changes, but we have such a diverse team that we, our team speaks multiple languages. So um, even if we don't need to have an interpreter in some cases, because our staff has, it, has that capability. Hmm. Well, is, this is an interesting question. Is there a time where the trainer learned from the trainee? Every time. And I think that's why to be a great Orbis volunteer faculty, the humility piece, being a global citizen and realizing that the best innovation comes with limited resources. The best cataract surgeons I've ever worked with are not from the United States. Hmm. So let me, let me be clear. You can learn a lot by going to India, Nepal, places like this and seeing some of the people I mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, I, I think you can learn a lot about diseases that you've never seen. Like there's a disease that we treat called trachoma. It's an infectious cause of blindness. Um, and every year we distribute over a quarter billion dollars worth of Zithromax to get rid of the bacteria that's causing that in Ethiopia. Well, no resident in the United States sees it. But when they come out on the Orbis plane as part of our associate program, they're like, oh my God, I didn't even, I've never seen trachoma. Move out of the way, I want to see that. And, you know, for example, uh, rubella. You know, when's the last time you've heard of someone having rubella? But rubella can cause cataracts in unborn children. And so during, you know, my residency, I never saw rubella cataracts. I was in Ethiopia, and one day I saw 10 cases. So I, I do think that every time you go out to Orbis, you're gonna learn something about yourself, your limitations, your comfort zone, your skill set, how you communicate. I think you're gonna learn from the patients. These are very different patients. When you sit and talk to someone and you realize that they're a refugee, you need to have an entire different approach and their level of trust and how are they gonna feel when they wake up from anesthesia. That's why our nursing team is so amazing. They are the most, they practice compassionate empathy at a level I, I don't, and I learn from them. So yeah, I would say that if you're gonna come out to Orbis, you better be ready to teach and learn. And that's even how to say thank you or right and left in the local language, things like that, yeah. Um, here's an interesting one as well. What is involved in maintenance visits for the aircraft in terms of disassembling the hospital and reassembling after maintenance? How does it differ from regular aircraft maintenance? And I know that might be somewhat different with the modular units now, but. Yeah, that, it was certainly a, a challenge that we went through, and it, it took us some time to, if you can imagine an airplane this size, there's roughly um, 1,600 plus line items. Now, there's, there's uh, to that, there might be five different task cards for each line item, right? So you're talking thousands of inspections you do. We had to actually go through, and now we now have on the uh, maintenance planning document that's provided by uh, Boeing, we've went through every single document and looked at where the hospital is and determined which ones require hospital removal and which ones that we can work around either by an alternate means of compliance or so. So every document is done. We just removed here, the last, uh, here in the last uh, year, we removed the hospital for the first time. Uh, and basically we've been able to uh, realign, uh, what we did is realign all the maintenance aspects and did all the inspections so they come due at the same time. Mm -hmm. So now it requires the hospital to be removed every six years. Uh, we have a low utilization maintenance program that the FAA and Boeing has approved. Um, so now every six years the hospital comes out, 
The other years, uh, six months inspections and annual inspections, all could be done without the hospital removal. But it took a great deal of support from Boeing and FedEx and engineers to analyze all those different yeah. uh, inspections to figure out which ones needed to be done at what time and then realign them was the key. Yeah, that's a lot. Wow. Um, you spoke to Orbis's role in diplomacy. Can you speak to specific engagement and how you see the organization participating in that much larger story of a united global community? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I'll use the program we just did uh, less than three weeks ago. So uh, Bruce got us into Doha and Qatar right before the World Cup. Mm. And it was the first time in our 40 year history where we had all female faculty, all female participants with women from conflict zones. And these are women coming from Afghanistan and places where they don't always have the opportunity to do international, there's seven countries, but um, so to me, that's the exact thing we're trying to do is highlight a cause that people don't know about, either gender discrepancy and blindness or access to training and creating a safe space and a flying Switzerland where there's neutrality, where anyone can come. And for me, that's super exciting. We, you know, our nursing team, like I said, is driving a lot of our clinical care. Well, our, one of our nurses is from Kenya, how he sterilizes instruments and he's teaching us how to do that. That's really cool. And so if you said, you know, with functional diplomacy, it's everyone has a voice, everyone has equity, and that's something we try to have on the plane and provide a platform for that as well. And so like, I'm super proud of the Flying Eye Hospital team for what they just did in Doha. Like if you think about that, to coordinate these women coming from conflict zones for simulation training and getting literally the best possible simulation training anywhere on earth. I mean, even better than what I got as a resident. Now that was back in the day when we put leeches on people, but yeah, it's still you know really incredible what we've been able to do. And that just speaks to, we're, we're, we're non-denominational, you know, we're not faith-based. Um, we have people from all walks of life on our team, but when we're on the plane, all we talk about is ophthalmology. I guess and each other, but yeah, <laughs> the, the, about ophthalmology. But yeah, I, I would say that um, to me, the flying United Nations is something we, we have to really keep core, that we don't have an agenda other than blindness and teaching, and that um, our culture is about ophthalmology and surgical safety. Mm -hmm. Am I missing any questions in here? I think there's, uh, there's one over here to the okay. left there. Okay. Yeah. So you may want to repeat the question for the audience. Yeah, okay. So his question was, uh, how do you uh, deal with going in and out of remote locations with an older aircraft? Uh, this aircraft has actually a, a 1973 model uh, aircraft. So it is uh, aging for sure. Although, uh, based on how we, first of all, how we fly this airplane, we fly about, its primary job is to sit as a hospital. So we only fly at about 100 hours a year, uh, maybe 20 cycles a year. This aircraft will never hit its uh, uh, structural, uh, primary structural element again. Um, uh, so as far as the airframe goes, we could fly it for a thousand years with the number of uh, cycles and, and hours we fly it. The question though becomes, how about parts? Well, first of all, uh, some of the countries we go to, it would be almost virtually impossible to, uh, to get a part through customs. For instance, you know, uh, places like Indonesia, Qatar is another good example. They have laws built where you can't bring in used parts. So I got a 40 some year old airplane. I can't bring a part in there because their laws say you can't bring a used part into the country. So we have a large, uh, uh, our partner FedEx does all the analytics for us to how many, how many uh, ADIs fail or uh, TCAS computers fail. And then we carry those aboard. We have 100 plus parts ab aboard the aircraft that we carry that uh, would be MEL restricted that if we didn't have them, we couldn't go. So we've made that determination what those parts are. Uh, and then our partner FedEx gives us a free shipping code. So as long as we can get it in there, we can have it across the world in uh, a day or two at the worst case. And then we, we only fly a, a short period of time so we can, we can wait for the part. It's a really important example of what we've learned from aviation. You know, the Department of Redundancy Department 
And we've done that now with the hospital, where we don't have single points of failure with the hospital equipment, that we've got backups to the backup. That's something that we learned from aviation. They have their MEL, which I never knew what that was for the first two. I kept looking for this guy, Mel, but uh, it's the minimum <laughs> equipment list. And that's like, what do you absolutely need in the worst case scenario? So if during general anesthesia there was a medical emergency, we have the defibrillator, we have a backup defibrillator, we have suction, we have backup suction, we have oxygen concentrators, and we have oxygen cylinders for backing up the oxygen concentrator. I think that's something, again, we've learned from Bruce in aviation is, you know, always have a plan for your plan. And I think, too, also thinking outside the box, one thing we learned is a, a good example is uh, you can imagine carrying spare tires. The tires on this thing are huge. You know, they're, you know, four foot tall. They weigh hundreds of pounds. Brakes is the same way. You sort of think outside the box. This airplane has a center landing gear that can be retracted. So our spare wheels, tires, and brakes are on the center landing gear that we can MEL. So it's just sort of thinking outside the box. If I got a bad tire, I take it off the center gear, throw the bad one on the center, retract it. MEL it and reduce the gross weight for takeoff and landing. So it, it's those kind of things thinking outside the box. Uh, when we talked about uh, venting the oxygen, I went to the engineers and we said, how are we gonna vent this oxygen overboard? And of course the FAA and Boeing, the manufacturers, they don't, uh, mostly they've been around big airplanes, the pressure vessel, the last thing you wanna do is put a new hole in an airplane, right? So uh, one of the engineer buddies of mine, when I called him, he said, well, Bruce, he said, you know, we've got, uh, there is, is a hole, though. there's a window, right? And oh, by the way, we've got a, 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 a approved part from the FAA to replace a window with a window plug. And then we um, had a, the crew oxygen port, the overpressure that we have for the normal crew oxygen. So we just attached one approved part to another approved part and put it in the window and asked the FAA to prove it. So we had approved parts and what's the argument, right? And we didn't puncture a new hole in the airplane. So again, it's all about thinking outside the box, whether it be medical or it be in aviation. Mm. Um, how can industry professionals, either medical or aviation, get involved in supporting Orbis? Do the medical first. Yeah, I mean, we're always driven, like I said, by volunteers and people who want it. We are completely dependent on people giving their time, their money, their expertise, their supplies. So if you go to the Orbis website, www.orbis.org, or you can see how to, how to give and how to donate. And it, whether you want to be a volunteer faculty, a pilot, it's interesting though, some of the best volunteers we've had, like a person brought their spouse and she was operating, he's a lawyer, he helped draft the first informed consent for one of the hospitals where we're working. We can always find a way, and that talks to Bruce, there's so much need in this area and the challenges that we're gonna find some, if you say we wanna help, we'll find a job for you. You know, Even if it's helping clean up at the end of the day, we can get you busy on an Orbis program one way or another. I would say on the aviation side, maybe a little bit different than the clinical only because there's nothing like it for us. Um, our aircraft mechanics um, work on diesel generators. They work on air conditioners. They, uh, uh, they're not just aircraft mechanics. So um, probably the best thing to do is give me an email. Send me an email. Give me a call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll send you over to our senior manager aircraft matrix, Val uh, Suberg, and uh, she'll give you an interview. And if you pass her, uh, you're, you're hired. <laughs> well, we're getting close to the end here. Um, I want to ask one more question. This is uh, kind of, it's a good for a vision question. Can you both speak to the next steps for Orbis? Where do you hope to see the organization go in the future? Yeah, and I think going back to the 66 years from the Wright brothers to walking on the moon, we give a lot of thought. We just did a strategic planning session while the plane was in Dubai about this. I really think the plane's always gonna be an incredible platform, as we've just shown with the uh, program in Doha. I think technology and what's coming down the pipe and what you can do now with your cell phone. Turning a cell phone into a retina camera that can automatically do AI in the field. Everyone's getting a voice. That, that phone has more technology than James Bond did 20 years ago. So I think the answer is always embracing technology looking that blindness unites the world and that's something that we can use as Orbis to connect people from all walks of life and really driving simulation, telemedicine, distance learning, 
and what we've learned from the plane with the combination of the marriage, sometimes good, sometimes tough, uh, between pilots and doctors. That to me is exciting. Where if you think about it, more people on this planet have access to the internet than clean water. So if you think about that, how can we leverage that to get the word out about blindness? Everyone, everyone listening today, everyone in the audience, I hope you go home and tell someone to check their eyes, right? My grandfather died blind. It was terrible. Mm. And he was blind for a long time, and it was horrible. And I remember as a little kid being scared of him because he was blind. Mm. I, you know, my dad has had retina surgeries. It's, it's very devastating if you know, you're, you're, you're sitting there without vision or you're fearful of your vision. So getting the word out, super important. And the plane is the best platform for that. Where I see us in 25 years isn't on the moon. It's that every single person here on Earth can see the moon at night. Everyone can see their loved one, and no one's sitting there for a decade not knowing what their wife looked like, their grandchild looked like, or their sibling. If we achieve that, like I know there's unbelievably brilliant people on the Earth looking at walking on Mars, and that's incredible. But just here on Earth, the thing that makes it so anachronistic, we have the solution for cataract blindness in our hand. It's not like finding the cure for cancer. It's a five-minute procedure. Yeah. We can train people to do this faster, better. That, to me, is what I would like to be able to do is in 25 years retire and feel like there's no more trachoma, that bacteria causing blindness in Africa and in Ethiopia. There's no more cataract blind, and that we've leveraged technology so that every single training doctor, nurse, engineer can get the same level of training, and we're applying that especially to the bottom billion who needs it most. We just passed 8 billion people, right? That was something that happened in the news in the last few days. Mm. Like, we have enough problems here on Earth. Let's get those done. And for me, the solutions are here. And what's exciting is Orbis is now just looking for force multipliers. And I think for me, it's maybe a little bit different, maybe in some ways easier, some ways maybe harder. My job is to keep up with his needs to provide those kind of services whether they i mean okay, we are what, in a marriage what, now. Well, well a good example when we were building the airplane the monitors were advancing in technology so fast that be from the start of the modification to the time when it first flew we went through four mon upgraded four monitors and of course new wiring new you know we just finished the rewiring it's now six cat 6a cabling it's it, so it's keeping up with the technology that they need to provide the service they need is what what our ultimate goal is is to provide that platform for them to be able to do their job but it's super exciting i mean i i mean i get up every day and i'm tired but i'm also super excited to see what the next 15 year old is going to invent that's going to i mean i never thought we'd be doing gene therapy and having little kids who are not able to see well six months later riding a bike. I didn't think that was gonna happen when I graduated med school. Yeah. And so, you know, I wake up, I know we live in difficult times, but like there's never been a better time to be alive as an ophthalmologist because we're gonna knock this out. I mean, we will. I mean, that, I don't worry about that. And like, I do believe you. you know, and the trachoma, that was in Ireland until the 1950s, right? If you watch Godfather 2 and Don Corleone is coming through the turnstiles, they're flipping his lids as a little kid looking for trachoma. We don't do that. When people come through JFK or Dulles Airport, they're not flipping their lids looking for trachoma. I hope that if I live long enough, we're going to be able to say that there's no more trachoma. And cataracts are a thing of the past. It's anachronistic that I'm sitting here talking about cataract blindness when we have the cure in hand. And you know, the people who started Orbis, that was their whole goal showing modern day microsurgery, showing how you can take out the, the cloudy lens and put in the new piece of plastic lens to replace it. The whole purpose was to get rid of cataract blind. That's our mission. Now we're extending that to other diseases, but it'd be really cool to be able to say that no one's blind anymore. And we, we put a dent in that universe. Well, you're, you're really doing it. I mean, you are, you're going around the world, you're, you're doing it. You're, you're, bringing it to all these locations that, you know, never thought that they would get that kind of care and you're just spreading it as far as you can. So I, I do believe that you folks will really, you know, get close to those goals of yours. They, they certainly seem obviously manageable to a degree. Just got to get it done. Got to get it done. You guys have been so fascinating. Um, I just want to thank you both, Hunter and Bruce, it's for this fabulous work that you do. It's, it's just unbelievable to understand that you can do that, that you can cure so much of this, and that it's just waiting out there to be done with, with people like you. So 
hats off to you. You just do marvelous work, and I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to bring it to everyone here so they can understand what, what you all do. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Welcome. Thank you. So I wanted to just plug our next General Electric lecture. Um, it's going to be on December 1st. We have Sean D. Tucker, who is an amazing aerobatic pilot, lived a lifetime in aviation and aerobatics, and he will be speaking downtown at the museum on the mall. Uh, his aircraft is at the entrance of the Thomas uh, W. Haas We All Fly Gallery, so it's going to be really exciting. And he is a dynamic person, so I uh, ha hardly uh, in, you know, think that that will be a great uh, lecture for everyone to enjoy. Um, I want to thank our sponsor for the evening, GE Aerospace, which has always been a terrific sponsor for us. And yes, round of applause, please. Again, thank you, Hunter and Bruce. J just marvelous work. It really is amazing. So just, uh, you know, it's just, I'm just in awe of, of what you folks do. Um, and so I'm just going to wrap it up and say thank you to our audience online. Thank you to our audience here. Uh, at the Hazy Center, and I hope everyone has a good evening.